Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Glasser, staff writer and Washington columnist for The New Yorker. Welcome to a special G Zero Media live stream. Unfinished business. Is the world really building back better? This program is brought to you in partnership with Microsoft. And over the course of the next hour, we're going to tackle that key question about the pandemic recovery, as well as several others. You'll hear from leaders at the center of this global crisis and have your chance to weigh in as well. To kick us off, I'm joined by my friend, Ian Bremmer, president of G Zero Media and the Eurasia Group, and Brad Smith, president and vice chair of Microsoft. Brad and Ian, great to be with you today. Great to be here. I want to say hi to both of you, and I should point out that we actually sat together, at least virtually, exactly one year ago during the 75th UN General Assembly. And we had, unfortunately, a very similar conversation. On that program, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, we might come out of this pandemic with the capacity to build back a world with more inclusive and sustainable perspectives. But we might come out of it with a world where chaos would become the main logic of international relations. So, Brad, where do you think we are on that spectrum right now? Well, I think we're at an early stage. I would say there's some good news and there's some bad news. I think in some ways the miracle of 2021 is the spread of vaccines around the world. And while there's understandable and well-founded concerns about vaccine equity, the reality is that yesterday we reached you know, 3 billion, 427 million people almost exactly nine months after the FDA granted emergency approval for the first vaccine. I don't think any one of us would have predicted that positive a result when we had this event a year ago. But at the same time, as always, I think the strains across the world are showing themselves clearly. Uh, we all know that vaccines are making it to some continents faster than others. We're seeing you know, governments come together, but mostly we're seeing governments pull apart. And I know as Ian will want to touch upon, uh, you know, there is a fair amount of chaos. Maybe there's always a fair amount of chaos, but I think this is a year where we're seeing lots of chaos as well. Well, you know, Brad, it's interesting. I mean, Secretary General Gutierrez, uh, when he launched this year's version of the UN General Assembly, you know, he talked about being on the precipice of the abyss. So that's not exactly a positive message. And, you know, I'm struck by, you know, our ability uh, to not learn uh, the lessons of the past over and over again, right? You know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we knew that there would be a point at which, assuming we got vaccines, the world would need to come together and cooperate. Right now, President Biden is in Washington hosting a vaccine summit, and yet uh, the, the numbers are just extraordinarily low when it comes to large swaths of the world. Is there is there a chance to, to make up from what seems like a, a remarkably slow uh, start and, and, and a long, long, long pandemic? Well, I think there is a lot of opportunity to move faster and to move more broadly. If you look at the current course and speed, you know, we'll reach about another billion people with vaccines every three months. Uh, and we have the opportunity to accelerate that. We should be able to. Production is obviously increasing. Uh, the richer governments are focused more on helping the poor. They can afford to, after all. They have vaccinated just about everybody in their countries that has wanted a vaccine. Um, so I think the short answer is we should be pushing ourselves and we should be aiming higher and we'll see what comes out of the next couple of days. So Ian, I want to bring you into this. Uh, you know, I feel like Brad has given me a welcome dose of positivity, uh, but I, I'd like to well, get welcome two doses, more of you. Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take a third too. Uh, if that's not uh, that's part of the problem, of course. But yes. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, so you know, are we really, as as the Secretary General said the other day, on the precipice of the abyss here? It's pretty apocalyptic framing for a UN General Assembly. It is, and he's not talking about the pandemic. He's talking about yeah. the implications after a year and a half of the pandemic for creating global leadership in response to truly global challenges. I mean, Brad's absolutely right. Uh, where we are today in terms of vaccine production and distribution compared to where we thought we might have been a year ago is staggeringly positive news. 
But that's very different from any level of trust between either the United States and China, the United States and its European allies today even, um, and the developed and the developing world. And if you want to respond effectively on climate, you want to respond effectively on the challenges of a global economic recovery, what Antonio is saying as the Secretary General of the United Nations is that he's not getting anything close to the kind of trust, coordination, and commitment from global leaders that he really wants. And when he says sleepwalking towards the abyss, I mean, I want to be clear, it's not very fast, and it's not with intentionality. It's sleepwalking. He's not saying that we're about to go to war against each other. What he's saying is that absolutely critical time is being lost, and underlying problems are getting worse as a consequence. And who's going to pay for that? We are. We all are here around this table at the UN General Assembly. That's the underlying concern, even as Brad and I sit here with pretty good news in terms of where we are with responding to COVID. Well, and that's a great pivot point to our next conversation because we're gonna examine this issue over the course of this hour from several key angles today. We'll be talking, of course, about vaccine uptake globally, but also the economic recovery, bridging the equality gaps the pandemic has always uh, has only exacerbated. Uh, but first, before we go on, uh, I wanna note that we have already asked our audience on social media for their thoughts on some of those big questions that we're talking about today. And one of the questions we posed was uh, derived directly from the title of this program, is the world building back better from the pandemic? Yes or no? I'm very curious to see uh, whether the uh, optimism I'm hearing from you and Brad to a certain extent is mirrored from the audience. And now we have up on the screen the graphic with the results. And I got to tell you, this is how the audience voted. 34% of you said yes, building back better. 66% said no. Uh, if anything, I would say it surprises me, that result. It's a little bit more positive than I would have guessed. Uh, Brad, what do, you, what do you make of those results? Well, I think it accurately captures the mood that we sense here in New York this week, talking to so many people. Uh, I think it actu act accurately captures the concerns that are well-founded. Um, and as you're pointing out, Susan, and as Ian mentioned, you know, if you ask about the state of trust between nations in the world, if you ask about the state of economic development and whether we're seeing the divides of the world exacerbated or closed, um, you know, there's a lot of cause for concern. And those are big challenges that may well prove more difficult to address than the pandemic itself. And my guess is people are seeing that. I would also add to that, that is the world building back better well, the United States and China, the two largest economies in the world, are increasingly turning inwards. And we see that uh, with uh, the, the great statement from Biden on multilateralism, but a lot of mistrust internationally, the Americans are really there for them. Great to see the United States double the commitment to the developing world to 11 plus billion a year uh, in terms of support for sustainability transition, but still nowhere close to what the Americans had promised historically. Meanwhile, in China, uh, you see an announcement that they're no longer gonna be funding coal outside of China, but that's also because they're not funding Belt and Road anymore. Belt and Road investments are down about 90% over the last five years. And what everyone's talking about on the sidelines, uh, sidelines of the UNGA this week is potential financial crisis as Evergrande in China turns towards default, $300 billion. The potential for a debt limit crisis in the United States, same. So if the two largest economies in the world are increasingly focused inward, even as they have fairly robust recoveries themselves, mm -hmm. the most robust in the world, really, well, the rest of the world, this is a global panel we have today, and it's global respondents. They're going to be increasingly unsettled by the news and the headlines that we're facing. So I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Susan. I, I'm not surprised at all. The mood music is not that we're building back better globally. 
Well, that's right, Ian, and not even that we're not done with the pandemic. So it's a little bit hard uh, to uh, move on from a pandemic that's killing an average of more than 2,000 Americans a day, never mind uh, the toll that it's exacting in parts of the world where there are almost no uh, meaningful vaccination yet of the population. And so that's where we're going to go next in this conversation. Uh, as part of the world looks to recovery, many nations are still in the middle of the pandemic. And this summer, Leaders of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, the WTO, released a joint statement saying, in part, by now it's become abundantly clear there will be no broad-based recovery without an end to the health crisis. And access to vaccination is key to both. So that's where we're going to start with our deep dive today, looking into the current state of vaccine distribution, vaccine nationalism, and vaccine hesitancy. Dr. Mike Ryan is the executive director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program. And I'm very glad to welcome him for this conversation because I think we can't talk about anything else until we talk about this. Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Dr. Ryan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, if you can hear me. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I, I want to start out by asking you about your recent statements on COVID. That is uh, like the flu in the sense not of deadliness, but that it's likely to stay with us and not be eradicated in some permanent way. So what does that mean moving forward? Are we living in a, a forever pandemic? Uh, no, because it depends how you characterize a pandemic. And when we look at uh, uh, previous pandemics of influenza, the, the virus that caused the last pandemic in 2009 is still circulating, but it's not causing pandemic levels of infection and it's not causing pandemic levels of severity, hospitalization or other things, and we have vaccines against it. So a pandemic is not an epidemiologic character uh, characterization, it's, it's much more complex than that. What we would like to do is get to the end of an acute phase of this pandemic, and let me remind everyone um, that nobody is out of this pandemic. It's not that some countries are coming out of the pandemic and some countries are still in there. Nobody is out of this. Because whatever happens in other countries, uh, particularly with the development of variants, can come straight back and ignite uh, transmission uh, and disease and uh, severe disease at any moment. So we're still in this very much together. We either come out of this together or we don't. Yes, let me ask you about the emergence of variants. Obviously, the uh, the rise of the Delta variant has uh, set the stage for a very, very problematic uh, fourth wave here in the United States. Uh, what is your current assessment of uh, the possible emergence of, of new and even vaccine-resistant variants? Is that a realistic possibility at this point that we have to prepare for? I, I think we need to be ready for everything, and uh, but uh, our best bet right now, and we, we need to, and previous speakers have said it, we, we've developed collectively some of the most innovative uh, countermeasures uh, in the fastest time ever in the history of, 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 of humankind. And we have these vaccines and they're precious gifts to humanity and we need to use them properly. And using them properly will not only stop the suffering and death, but it will reduce transmission and it will reduce the capacity of the virus to be able to um, generate mutations. So suppressing transmission, either through public health measures and through vaccination, is our best way to reduce the emergence of, of uh, uh, new strains. But it can always happen. It's a natural process in nature and we need to be ready if that happens. And that's why we've been tracking uh, with so many partners around the world, all of these variants of interest and various of, variants of concern for months and months and months because we're concerned about them. But we also need to recognize too that the vaccines still work, uh, the diagnostics still work, those tools are still highly effective. So we have a way out of this, but we need to track those uh, emergent variants. And if we don't distribute vaccine more equitably around the world, then we're going to leave parts of the world for this virus to, to transmit completely unhindered. And in that setting, we may generate more variants uh, and those variants may come back uh, and, and potentially those variants could escape uh, the effectiveness of our vaccines. And that's something we're concerned about. We hope that's not the case. There will be second and third generation vaccines that will come online that will deal with that. But everything in this response is about timing. It's about having the right intervention in the right 
time at the right place. Uh, and every time we have to shift course, every time we have to adapt our tactics or a strategy, that takes time, the virus wins. So in this case, our best tactic and our best strategy right now is to share vaccines around the world, drive down transmission, continue to implement our public health and social measures and keep this virus under control. Because right now the virus is in control. We're not in control. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we're talking about vaccines. Which region specifically right now concern you the most when it comes to vaccine distribution? I think there are countries struggling to access vaccines pretty much all over the planet, uh, certainly uh, in the Americas and in Asia. Uh, but if we look at the countries that are furthest behind overall as a block, the, the African countries are low income countries. Uh, if we talk about high income countries, there's about 130 vaccines per 100 people have been used in, in, in those countries. If you go to low income countries, that's uh, 2.3 vaccines per 100 people. Uh, uh, so 70 percent of our vaccines have been used in just 10 countries. So we have a huge gap in vaccine supply particularly in, in Africa. And that is my greatest concern right now in terms of vaccine access, for sure. So the WHO is right now estimating that 25% fewer COVID vaccine doses will be distributed this year than had been forecast as recently as July. Why is that? And whose fault is it? I think we have, and this has been said many, many times, we've had uh, lots of uh, countries engaged in bilateral deals, uh, over-purchasing, uh, meeting more than their country's needs. We've had prioritization of those bilateral deals by by manufacturers. Uh, and in that sense, COVAX uh, was set up as a mechanism in AVAT within the African region to create a transparent, fair and equitable way to deliver vaccines to all the countries based on their epidemiologic need. That system works. COVAX works. The problem is the supply into COVAX has not come. Uh, and the countries who've purchased vaccines on the, on the open market and competed with each other and with those countries, competed them out of the market and competed COVAX out of the market. And those uh, companies that have pre preferentially uh, prioritized uh, bilateral deals over supplies to, to COVAX. Everyone uh, needs in that process needs to ask themselves that question. But I think today is a very important day. And, you know, the President Biden is, is currently uh, really pulling people together to try and look at how we fix this. So recriminations about how we got here uh, are fine, but we need to get out of here. And the way out of here is to accelerate production of vaccines, to increase their distribution, to get them to the places they need to be. And we have the capacity to do that. If global leaders really grip on this issue, make the commitments and keep the commitments they're making if manufacturers do the same and if we as un and other agencies and ngos work with governments to, to ensure they have the capacity to deliver those vaccines then we can change the game here we can change the outcome so we have a massive moment of hope right now to be able to take this precious gift we've been given vaccination and ensure that every person on this planet has access to that vaccine and particularly those people with underlying conditions and uh, older persons and health workers. There are health workers who've gone to work today in COVID worlds, who around in, in countries in the, on this planet who don't have a COVID vaccine. Uh, and we need to recognize that we need to bring those vaccines to them as quickly as possible. Well, let me ask you uh, in that context about boosters, uh, which seems to be the next front in the in the debate between, uh, you know, wealthy nations and uh, essentially vaccine nationalism versus the, the global need uh, to distribute these more widely. What is your view medically, uh, first of all, on the necessity of boosters? And second of all, uh, on the question of whether wealthy nations should be distributing those boosters right now? Um. I think there's been uh, and continuing there's continuing scientific data being collected and analyzed clearly there are individuals and groups who uh, may require a third primary dose people whose immune immune systems may be compromised they may not have generated a full immune response to two doses and they may need uh, a third primary dose uh, there may be uh, many situations in which countries want to give uh, a third or booster doses to certain proportion, certain sections of the population. And we've seen many regulatory authorities and others look at that and look at the evidence for that. Overall, the, the scientific evidence to support general boosters and the general population is not there yet. And that may change in the coming months. Uh, but the reality is that the death uh, 
the hospitalizations and all of what we see in the world is really a, now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, not the pandemic of the two vaccinated, but the, the pandemic of unvaccinated. And you even see that in the US and in Europe, the vast majority of people who have been hospitalized or dying are people who are unvaccinated. We need to get people vaccinated with those first two doses or a one dose if it's a J&J vaccine. That is the principle here. And this isn't an absolute trade-off. There's enough vaccine to do both. There's enough vaccine to start sharing vaccines in a much more systematic way. Uh, the, 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 the objective here is to get to 40% coverage in target populations by the end of the year. This is possible to get there and for, for countries in, in the industrialized countries to begin the process of protecting or giving extra protection to certain groups in the population. But the idea of giving a, a third a uh, booster dose to uh, to members of the general population while we while we leave people in other countries who have underlying conditions and an age profile and a work profile that gives them greater exposure and a greater chance of having severe disease in 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 our view is 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 ethically uh, difficult uh, and we need to prioritize i've said it before this is like handing out uh, two life jackets one you know an extra life jacket to people who already have one while we leave people without life jackets to drown. Uh, and we need to really internalize that. We can do both. We can begin the process of deciding within highly vaccinated populations who needs to have a booster dose and continue to collect that evidence. And while we're doing that, we can start to distribute vaccines more equitably around the world. And I would remind many uh, high income countries again, that the people who are now in hospital, people who are now dying uh, from COVID, are people in the main who were unvaccinated in the first place. We need to focus on the unvaccinated as our primary target. And yes, we need to focus on the need for boosters or third primary doses in certain groups. And that can begin to happen. But but and I we believe that both can happen if the focus is put on this. Dr. Ryan, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you about the unvaccinated in the countries where the vaccine is available, the people who've been given a life jacket and chose not to use it. It's not just in the United States that you're seeing these high rates of vaccine hesitancy, but even other countries like Russia. How do you combat that globally? Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's uh, if, it, if it was easy and straightforward, everyone would be doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's not... It's not as straightforward as people as people think. There is, uh, in many countries, a high degree of vaccine eff- uh, vac- vaccine hesitancy, uh, and people have questions, and they have genuine questions that require answers. And the medical community and the public health community and governments need to get very, very sophisticated and good at giving people the information they need, providing people with credible information from scientists and from authorities that that reassures people just how life-saving, just how important, just how valuable these vaccines are. Uh, And I think we need to continue with that. Uh, There is uh, uh, misinformation out there and we need to combat that misinformation by not attacking the messengers, but by getting better at creating the good information channels that people can access. There is uh, deliberate misinformation and that's not just coming from you know the, the 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 classic idea of people being disruptors and just trying to put misinformation out there for mischief. Some of this is coming from politicians. Some of this is coming from 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 people who should know better. And that politicization of of misinformation for the pro- weaponization of that information for political purposes is the most ha- abhorrent part uh, of this process. We need a healthy debate on vaccines all the time. These are medical products that are going in to our fellow human beings and to ourselves. And we all want to know that these are safe and effective and we want to have our questions answered. And we need to get very good at answering those questions. Uh, But we also need to recognize that there are people who profit from or who benefit from uh, uh, proactively putting out misinformation and be that financial benefit or be that political benefit. And we also need to be able to combat that. Science needs to succeed over politics. Those are powerful words. Dr. Mike Ryan of the World Health Organization, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. So now we're going to go back to the question that we began with at the beginning of this live stream. I remember quoting the UN Secretary General from our show last year during the General Assembly. Uh, Recently, Ian Bremmer sat down once again with Antonio Gutierrez, now more than 18 months into this global pandemic. And here's some of what he had to say. As 
the Secretary General, I mean, you are the man who is most aligned with global leadership, with multilateralism. And so I have to say, from my perspective right now, when I look at climate change, when I look at the response to the pandemic, when I look at Afghanistan, it doesn't feel great right now. The trajectory feels pretty bad on all of those issues. How do you respond to that in your position? Well, we are facing a number of dramatic challenges. A virus is defeating us as an international community. Climate change, uh, we are far from the consensus that is needed between developed and developing countries to really be able to get to net zero in 2050. And at the same time, we see this multiplication of crises uh, uh, all over the world. We are going in the wrong direction in all these aspects. We see a geopolitical divide uh, that is becoming deeper and deeper. The geopolitical divide today is such that in crucial areas like vaccine equity or climate action, we do not see the international community united, especially because the big powers are not united. The big powers are deeply divided. And this is a dramatic situation. Now, look at COVID. I mean, in my country, 80% of the population is vaccinated. Many African countries have 2% of the population vaccinated. We see mutations all the time. We see variants all the time. Now they speak about variants that might be able to be immune to vaccines. So as the COVID is spreading like wildfire in the developing countries, we risk to make the vaccines that are essentially available to developed countries useless. This is a suicide. Well, those are some strong words indeed from Antonio Gutierrez about the need for global cooperation or the lack thereof of global cooperation, not just on the pandemic and vaccine distribution, but also on the converging crises the world is facing in the future, including, including climate change, of course, and growing inequality. Joining us now to discuss that are David Malpass, president of the World Bank Group, and Michelle Bachelet, UN Human Rights Commissioner, and a former president of Chile, of course. Welcome so much to you both. I'm delighted to be with you today. So we're gonna, if it's all right, break this into two segments, this conversation today. First of all, let's talk about the pandemic because I don't think we can do anything else before we talk about where we are right now as a world. So let's look at what kinds of commitments and actions the pandemic requires. And then we can talk about the recovery, what that looks like and how we'll ensure people aren't left behind. David, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start with looking at the vaccine from an economic angle. How important is it to global recovery that more people are vaccinated more quickly? It's vital. Uh, thank you for raising the topic and prioritizing it. Uh, it's because that helps people get back to work. It saves lives. It's one of the best investments, probably the best investment that the world can make right now. For a small cost, you save lives. Uh, and I think we need to really push forward with that. The biggest challenge is to get early delivery dates for the vaccines into the developing world. Uh, the, the Secretary General uh, was just uh, mentioning the 2% vaccination rate. So we need to have um, more uptake of the vaccines in the developing countries and very critically, more deliveries. I, let me just quickly follow up on that. First of all, what is the World Bank's role in helping to facilitate that? And, you know, are you where you thought you would be globally now uh, or are we lagging behind? I mean, 2% is a pretty awful number. I think the poorest countries are lagging behind. The good news is the advanced economies have a huge excess of vaccines. So putting those two together is the challenge. Uh, the World Bank's role started in early in 2020 with the, uh, the assessments that were done of countries and their capacity to vaccinate their population. So that was that that needed to be done, a cataloging of that, which the World Bank did in conjunction with partners. Uh, and then uh, a second role for the World Bank uh, is to help countries then with their contracting processes and with their connections with, uh, with COVAX, with AVAT, which is the African uh, Vaccination Alliance, uh, in order to have the contracts ready so when the manufacturers, as they begin to have doses, uh, the doses can be connected to countries. That be that's been a very critical part of the, of the operation, the actual logistics of getting the right doses to the right countries. And then the 
World Bank is very involved in the deployment of it, meaning actual, actually financing uh, the medical services, the healthcare services in the countries. We have 54 country programs now uh, that can both buy the vaccines and can deliver and deploy the vaccines. And we work with a range of partners, including the UNICEF, various parts of WHO, and various uh, parts of the UN. Michelle, this summer you declared that the vaccine should be treated as a global public good. What exactly does that mean to you? And what do you think can be done to accelerate distribution to developing nations? I mean, you know, at this point, uh, we're a year and a half into the pandemic, and that 2% number is just uh, is just sticking with me. Well, thanks, Susan, and great to be with David and also with Ian and, and Brad. Uh, sorry to not be able to be there in New York with you. Well, what is global public goods? Uh, are those issues that benefit humanity as a whole, but cannot be managed by uh, one specific actor or state alone? And we have learned from COVID-19 that our interdependent and interconnectedness and interdependence, and we know that no one will be safe if everyone is safe. So that's why we believe that treating vaccine as a global public good means that we have to do as much as we can to ensure that everyone has uh, available vaccines and treatment for them everywhere in the in the world. And in order to achieve this, we need to uh, expand production capacity by all means. But we need also um, developed countries to stop stockpiling and to start distributing to countries who need it and that don't have access today to vaccines. And we also need to look at all the obstacles for people to have treatment or vaccines, including uh, looking at situations like the licensing procedures that many times are unduly complex and restrictive. So let me let me follow up by asking you, we talk a lot about the equity divide when it comes to the vaccine and distribution. If you could think of one or two things that absolutely would make a difference right now, what what would your top two things be? Well, I mean, the first thing, we, we need to ensure production because as we heard, Michael, we don't have enough production of vaccines, but there is an indefensible inequality between access to vaccine between uh, developing and developed countries. So that has a lot of consequences of human rights. So the most basic level, people are dying because they don't have access to vaccine uh, or to treatment. So I think that beyond that, we also know that, and we have been mentioned by many of the ones who spoke before me, that without uh, ensuring uh, a good, adequate response to the to the pandemic, we won't have economic recovery. And we do need that also because uh, if the societies go into a deeper economic recession, it will produce a lot of more socioeconomic consequences that we are already seeing today, but I'm not sure we have seen it in, 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 in its worst phase. I think it will come even worse. So we need, and also we know that all the sustainable development goals have been, I would say, are substantially set back because of the lack of our states to have fiscal space to, 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 to I would say, accelerate efforts on that regard. And finally, uh, one of the problems with, with the lack of vaccines, it's that this inequality at this global scale is producing, I would say, a real lack of trust and, and is undermining the, the representative uh, of uh, institutions. And so that will also lead to even more social unrest. So I think this is a, pro it's a very complex problem that, that it won't be solved only by ex uh, ensuring vaccines, but it will be really a, 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 an important help. Well, so David, let's talk about production. Uh, Michelle, I think correctly spotlight that as something concrete that we can talk about right now. Uh, you know, it's very hard to tackle countries and their uh, tradition of nationalism when it comes to a crisis, but it seems like a much more achievable goal to look at production. So let's talk about that when it comes to Africa, for example. Uh, what would it take to build the kind of infrastructure that you're talking about, that Michelle is talking about, and who would actually pay for it? The World Bank is able to help with that. For example, in South Africa, we have a new uh, operation through the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank, uh, working with Aspen Pharmaceuticals to drastically expand their production of the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen uh, dose, dosages. It takes 
uh, building the capacity, the skilled workers, uh, and then an investment, which uh, uh, IFC was able to then bring in other partners from the bilateral uh, community to put in the equity investment. We're working on similar uh, concepts of that in Rwanda, in Senegal, and so that will boost the production. But I should also note uh, the amount of uh, production in the advanced economies now is huge. It's been ramping up very quickly and also at the Serum Institute in India. And so that gives hope that there will be enough doses in October and in November and December. So the big challenge is the early delivery dates. My, I, I met uh, uh, just today with the president of Ecuador. They've been able to just in 100 days have a very high vaccination rate by allowing uh, the distribution of the, of the vaccines through private sector, through companies, for example, and through the, the uh, medical establishments. So I think the, the deployment uh, capabilities are there in many countries. Uh, I met yesterday with the president of Tanzania. They're having a challenge of the uptake of people's uh, hesitancy in taking the vaccine, but then simply not enough of the doses coming in. The countries need to know which week or which, at least which month will they be able to receive doses so they can prepare all the groundwork to deploy them rapidly. And that still is not happening in the international system. David, let's stick with that. And I want to bring back in Ian and Brad as well uh, to be a part of this conversation. Because Ian, you know, I know that uh, nationalism seems to be at the heart of a lot of the questions that we're encountering. Uh, almost every single person in this conversation today has brought it up in one way or another. This is obviously not a surprise to you uh, that we've been seeing uh, this response throughout the pandemic uh, from countries, not just the United States, not just China. It doesn't surprise you. but. What do, you, what do you think uh, about how the vaccine has played out geopolitically versus our expectations, say, uh, a year ago? Well, you're right. It doesn't surprise me. But I, I think it does surprise a lot of countries around the world who believe that after the Trump administration, that when Biden avowed multilateralist, Atlanticist, foreign policy expert, a senator for over 40 years, that, that there was going to be a real effort to rebuild trust and leadership in the United States on the global stage. And they've been very surprised that that hasn't happened to the same degree that they expected on vaccine export and leadership, on the way the Afghanistan withdrawal was executed, on the announcement of the US, Australia, UK defense fact and why the French ambassador to the US is presently sitting in Paris. That, that's surprising. And so you have to ask yourself, how is it possible that that president and that administration, as competent and thoughtful as they are, turns out to be one of the least trusted after the Trump administration in recent memory? And the answer is very simple. It's enormous prioritization of domestic politics. It's the fact that this administration is more focused on domestic politics than any we've seen in decades. And that is a constraint of inequality in the US. It's a constraint of disinformation in the US. It's a constraint of how divided the American polity has become. And I, I think you see that playing out in growing inequalities inside countries all over the world. Before Biden, Bolsonaro was speaking at the United Nations General Assembly just yesterday, and his speech was had nothing to do with his role in the rest of the world. It was all for the domestic audience and an election that he probably is gonna lose, uh, but we'll say is illegitimate next year. We see this playing out all over the world. So I think to try to bridge what Brad and I were talking about at the beginning of this presentation, where we are so optimistic about how many vaccines we have produced all over the world and they work, thank God, that's an amazing story. But the international leadership is almost all focused at home, even though the leaders themselves might prefer it to be otherwise. That's the challenge we're dealing with right now. Well, I think it's a hugely important point, Ian. And, and Brad, I want to ask you because, it, you know, one of the things that Ian is saying here, in effect, is that 
there is no such thing as a purely technocratic solution uh, to this crisis or to any of the crises that we're talking about globally. Uh, but let's talk about the private sector and its role. Uh, David highlighted a positive aspect of uh, the private sector in, in Ecuador, helping to distribute quickly the vaccine. What about the private sector's role in helping to distribute the vaccine equitably in this crisis? Is that something where the private sector can help? Well, I think there's a tremendous amount we can learn, Susan, by thinking about that question. Take the vaccine challenge, and I think what we need to do is break it into pieces. First, you need to develop and produce vaccines. The private sector is good at that, but we have seen enormous innovation in the past year where the private and public sectors have worked together, from Operation Warp Speed to what David was just describing in terms of additional financing in Africa. Second, you have to allocate the vaccines, whether you're talking about by country or within a country. I actually don't think the private sector has a role to play there. These are exclusively government decisions, and that, in fact, is what we're seeing around the world. But then third, you do have to distribute the, the allocation effectively. And as David was highlighting, it's, I think, not just Ecuador. In many countries, the private sector has played an important role as a distributor, as a contributor of know-how, because the private sector is in the logistics business, and oftentimes marshalling additional financial resources, not just for vaccines, but for PPE and oxygen supplies and the like. And then there's the final piece of the puzzle. We need to overcome vaccine hesitancy. And I think what we've learned is that we need every voice we can recruit to help people understand the importance of getting a vaccine. So you knit those together, and what I think it shows is that the private and public sectors can solve bigger problems when we work together, but with an understanding of our roles and ensuring role clarity so we each do what we're equipped to do and what we do best. So, Ian, the pandemic response hasn't just been politicized in the United States, of course. The World Health Organization has been criticized for its perceived deference to China. The global blame games have been abound bountiful throughout the past year, I would say. Uh, so, as we talk about the UN and other multilateral organizations and global alliances this year, we have President Biden promising uh, endless diplomacy. Uh, but uh, what's the goal? What's the end point here? Uh, you know, are we looking at a system that is weaker, uh, where trust is lower? I think Michelle very importantly made that point that one consequence of the pandemic for now appears to be less trust, not more trust in our institutions. Less trust, not more trust in political leaders. And this is how COVID makes it harder to respond to climate, an enormous point. Uh, that we all are trying to grapple with right now. But it also makes these institutions more important. Precisely when you have individual leaders of countries that you know, are really much more constrained and focused on domestic agendas, and particularly true of the United States and China, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the WHO, these organizations are critical to drive agendas. You know, when I think about climate right now, the United States and China have 2050 and 2060 agendas for net zero, but not really a path on how to actually get there in the U.S., no legislative support to do so. It's the private sector, it's the European Union, and it's the international organizations that are doing most of the driving. Now, your traditional international affairs, it would say, no, if you don't have the U.S. and China working together, you're going to fail on climate. No, actually, it's the multilateral organizations and it's the EU, which is the most supranational coordinated organization we have, that's doing more in providing the agenda that everyone else is going to have to get in step behind, precisely because the Americans and Chinese at the governmental level are focused so much more domestically. Well, you know, uh, David, uh, Ian brought up the China factor. The China factor is an issue that has plagued many multilateral organizations. Just last week, a story circulated about your predecessors at the World Bank allegedly manipulating data in China's favor in a 2018 report. How do organizations like yours, like the WHO, how do they work with China effectively and fairly in the future, given all of this? 
From the standpoint of the World Bank, we have a clear mission going forward to get more development in developing countries, to raise living standards, to fight poverty. My colleague, Carmen Reinhart, who's the chief economist of the World Bank, calls it the reversal problem, that, that poverty is going higher when it should be going lower, and living standards for many countries have gone down. You know, the inflation rate is really putting pressure on poor people uh, all around the world. From our governance structure, we have shareholders, and so it's a it's a pretty good system of, of seeing what the world wants and then finding the direction. And the good news is the world's pretty clear on that. I uh, that that that, that the, the the world benefits from development around the world and from from children, for example, getting enough nutrition so that they aren't stunted. We want to work on clean water, on electricity access. That's one of the SDGs for the. United Nations, and we uh, we are are pushing that forward uh, wherever we can uh, in a way that's cleaner, uh, but in a way that also uh, reaches rural areas. Uh, Brad was mentioning the importance of innovation, so I want to underscore that, and that includes uh, one of the key uh, uh, innovations that's going on is digitalization. That allows us to get money to poor people, uh, to get transaction costs down so that women uh, that uh, are, are, are making very small incomes can still participate in an economy because the transaction costs have come down. So these are some of the ways that we're moving forward and I think doing it well. You know, David, I'm so glad you brought up this important point of you know, looking beyond the pandemic and you know, is poverty going up rather than going down. What are the legacies, uh, economic and other, otherwise, of this pandemic? Are we potentially facing a world that's actually more unequal than before the pandemic started? Uh, the, certainly the early indicator suggests that absolutely is going to be the case. So, Michelle, let me ask you, the Gates Foundation just released new findings on the pandemic's impact on global poverty. And as David said, they're not looking good. So far, progress has been reversed by at least four years and 31 million additional people have been pushed into poverty. Is this a humanitarian emergency as well as a public health one? Well, I think it's a it's a health crisis, it's a um, human rights crisis, but also it's a social and economic crisis, the consequences of the pandemic. And also, of course, that had meant that it has impacted the lives, the livelihoods and rights of uh, women and men and children as well. Uh, and I think poverty is increasing, inequality is increasing. And of course, we have seen that depending on the capacity of states to respond, in some of them through that they already had social protection schemes or social protection programs, they have been able to support those people in need that had that stopped working or that uh, didn't have access to certain benefits. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, many countries have only developed sort of a transitional measures that will not necessarily be able to respond to all the deep consequences of the crisis. I already mentioned that um, we see a, a setback on our efforts to achieve sustainable development goals that David was mentioning, and the low-income countries really have um, are making us struggling because of their lack of fiscal space, because of our debt that they already uh, are facing, to really be able not only to respond to the to the pandemic, but also they have diverted resources. So many other other kinds of services like sexual and reproductive rights services that are not receiving uh, children in many countries of the world in Africa are not receiving normal vaccines for polio or tuberculosis or, or other kinds of vaccines. And we also have seen that um, the right to development has been uh, touched really strongly uh, and that inequality has uh, not only increased uh, among countries but inside countries as well. But the other thing that I would like to mention because people tend to look at the pandemic and on their response and also on the recovery phase as if people were homogeneous. And what we have seen with the pandemic, and I don't see enough that analysis in, in, in many places, is that it has not impacted the same everyone. It, of, of course, the virus, we can all have the virus, but the thing is that it impacts us proportionally certain groups, not because they are inheriting they have a particular vulnerability. They have the vulnerability because they have been marginalized and discriminated for so long. And I'm talking about women and girls, I'm talking about older people, people living with disabilities, LGBTI communities, people in the rural area, poor people, um, and people that um, 
are on the move, I mean, refugees, IDPs, or, or migrants. So the thing is that we need also to discuss and not only on global responses, but also thinking on, on policies that really will, will make a difference to leave no one behind. Because what will happen is that if we don't take into consideration these factors and the intersection between the different factors, we will be leaving people behind. Because if you're a woman, professional, live in a house with water, etc., you might not have a big problem. But if you are an older woman living with disabilities from an indigenous community, etc., your vulnerability will be much higher. And I don't see that answer in many of the policies. We have been trying to recommend states that in their response to the crisis and in their response also to the, in their phase of recovery, they should include this intersectionality because otherwise we're not going to have good results. You know, Michelle, I'm so glad you brought up this very, very important issue. Uh, the pandemic has clearly had a disproportionate impact on women. And actually, I want to share with you a portion of a conversation that Ian had this week with Fumzile Malambo Nguka, the former executive director of UN Women on exactly this topic. When you look at what's happened with the pandemic and the response, how has that affected your job? How has that affected your outlook on the world for women? It's certainly been a setback. I mean, it was not like we had made grand progress, but the limited progress is being compromised. Women in the labor market, we could be going back to a situation where a woman's place is at home and a man's place is at work. That needs policy interventions in order for countries to be conscious about not developing an architecture of the labor market that is uh, for men. Girls' education, we had made not perfect progress, but it was going the right way in, in, in many countries. Uh, the many children who did not go back to school after the pandemic in many countries are girls, and they have not gone back in some cases because of pregnancies, which is not from consensual sex, increase in trafficking, increase in child marriage. We estimate that about 11 million girls would not go back uh, to, to school after the pandemic. So that's a big setback. So, Michelle, uh, those are important thoughts, obviously. W what is your view on the most important thing that the world can do to make sure that women can stay in the workplace and don't slide even further into poverty globally right now? Well, I mean, there are some issues that uh, I have seen and ILO has seen that there will be a, a huge reverse on, on women's participation in the labor force because of things linked to the restrictions. For example, the lockdowns that women had to stay at home to take care because they couldn't go to work or because they had to take care of the children. Uh, we also saw a lot of women in the so-called uh, first uh, jobs in terms of uh, uh, first line uh, workers. But, and of course, I'm really concerned about the impact on women, but we, there are other issues as well that are really concerning, and that is the huge amount of women working in the informal economy. So they not only during the lockdowns could not do their job and get income for their houses, but also um, they were not uh, receiving the benefits of people who have a formal contract could receive in terms of social benefits or social protection or whatever subsidies the government had decided to, to do to support those people in need. Uh, but also, the uh, I would say the COVID-19 has made harder the livelihood uh, for women than for men, and yet we don't see that economic and fiscal policies include a gender responsive, um, are not gender responsive. Uh, and, and you should think on, for example, how you support areas where women work uh, the most as, for example, uh, tourism, gas, uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, and those are areas that have been particularly affected by the pandemic restrictions and, and, and by the pandemic itself. We also believe that, as Fumsila was saying, that we need to increase public investment in health, in education. We saw also that girls, there is a digital divide and girls did not went to school or did not have digital access. So we need to do a lot on this as well. We need to look at unpaid care work and, 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 and 
by how we support women that do a lot of things with unpaid work, but they're working, but it's unpaid. But we also need to analyze, I think, discriminatory laws, because there's a lot of laws in countries that hinder the opportunities of women to have jobs. But we also need to address, I would say, and also here, because Brad was mentioning, and I agree with him, that um, many of the decisions linked to vaccine are state decisions. But I think on this regard, business can play an important role to ensure how they, for example, support women's leadership and entrepreneurship, how they can, um, for example, have gender responsive answers to the, to the pandemic, how they promote um, inclusive and diverse workforce, how they can promote the UN guidance principles for business and human rights or the women's empowerment principles. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done. And I think we need to do much more than what we have been doing until now. So, Brad, I just want to bring you quickly in on that uh, because Michelle has pointed out, uh, you know, the role that business could uh, play in this. Uh, it's not just a government issue. What about the disproportionate uh, impact on women that this pandemic has seen, not just in the United States, but in many countries around the world? Well, I think there's an important lesson here for business on two fronts. One is to try to lessen the disproportionate harms on people who are more vulnerable, and in this specific case, as Michelle said, say women in the workforce. Uh, and you've seen some businesses you know, take what I would call enlightened steps uh, to provide greater ben benefits, longer leaves of absence, uh, new ways of working, including with digital te technology, to keep women in the workplace. And that's something we should do not just during the pandemic as we're debating you know, family leave in the United States. You know, we should join the rest of the world and make that a broader benefit. But then the second thing I think is a, a lesson here, the only way to build back better is to take the new tools and technologies that are going to be fundamental to the future and ensure that they are available and accessible and usable by people who may be of lesser means or in lower income countries or otherwise more vulnerable. And we think about the role of connectivity or the role of skills or digital skills or other things that are going to be important. We have a lot of work to do and I think we in the private sector can do more but this is absolutely an area where we're going to need to do more with a, a real group of multi-stakeholders and with government leadership as well. So thinking about what life looks like after the pandemic and the recovery, we have one final viewer poll today. We asked the social media followers, which of these is the greatest roadblock for the pandemic recovery? The choices were vaccine nationalism, growing inequality, and lack of geopolitical cooperation all of which we've talked about in abundance today. And I imagine that the answer could be all of the above. That's certainly the one that I would pick. Uh, but let me uh, bring in our panel on this conversation and then we can look at the results. Michelle and David, let's talk about the roadblocks. You both mentioned all of these at various points in your answers, but David, which would you say is the greatest of those problems that we face right now in terms of the recovery? You know, all of the above is the right answer, and they're all great. Uh, they're big problems, and I think we should uh, put it together that there's there's uh, challenges facing development that are huge, unprecedented. I think there has to be more vaccination, especially for those countries that have a low rate. Uh, there has to be, from an inequality standpoint, uh, there's this giant driving force from the advanced economies where the central banks are buying the assets of the bigger corporations and the bigger governments, the safety trade. And that makes it very hard for people that are new in the market, entrants, uh, developing countries, uh, to have access to capital. Uh, and so uh, balancing out that uh, is going to be an important part of getting the recovery going. Uh, and I think uh, as, as we look at it, the policies of the countries themselves have to be also improved to, to attract jobs, to attract new investment. They're doing that, uh, but not fast enough. And I think that can accelerate through cooperation, uh, but a lot of it is through leadership at the individual country level to, to pull us out of this chaos or this, this uh, uh, instability uh, that's plaguing much of the world.
Michelle, we're almost out of time, but what's your vote uh, when it comes to these three factors? <laughs> well, I, I would also say uh, all, all the above because I feel, I feel they're really interconnected. Because first of all, I think the lack of leadership, is, as Ian was mentioning, is, is key. Because I, I have learned that when there is a political will, there is a way. I mean, it's not easy, but the, you can do things. Even you can, you're not a rich country, but you can do things. And so, so the, of course, lack of leadership plus the geopolitical issues are linked. But on the other hand, we need uh, to ensure that, and that is political will also to fight against the growing inequalities with policies that can respond to that. And also, of course, ensuring vaccination. But one thing that I want to say, Susan, in the first poll, I would have voted for no. I will be part of the 66%. And I will tell you why. Because I think building back better is not only about uh, some of the issues we've been discussing. Of course, they're all interlinked. But I think people feel that they want to go back to normality. And normality, so-called normality, brought us where we are. I mean, those profound inequalities did not exist because of COVID. They had been exacerbated, aggravated by COVID-19, but this were the reality before. We had social and economic system that did not respond to people's needs. We had political system that did not respond to people's demands. And we have had before COVID-19, people on the streets, 80 countries in 2019, people protesting on the streets because of different reasons, inequality, corruption, or, or political issues. So when we talk talking about building back better. So when I'm thinking of the roadblocks, when we're talking about building back better, we have to think differently. We cannot go back to what brought us here. Mm. So those are the roadblocks now, but we need to think much more on how we really are able to ensure, and what the Secretary General was saying, I completely agree with it. And not only because he's my boss, it's because I think like <laughs> that. He has presented the common agenda saying, in other words, we have now two options. Either we break through, or we break down and we need to break down let me break through sorry and for that we all need to understand that we need to all work together with global solidarity with cooperation and with stronger multilateralism and if not we're going to break through and and that is a disaster for humanity Michelle, thank you so much for those powerful words. I'm now going to uh, uh, reveal the results, and I guess no one will be surprised. Lack of geopolitical cooperation comes in first with 42%, 32% vaccine nationalism, and perhaps for the reason that Michelle said, which is that it already existed, inequality gets 29%. Uh, Ian, it's been a really broad-based conversation. I want to thank you. I want to thank Brad. Uh, both of you for bringing us together today and convening us. G0 will also be bringing you live programming throughout the year from some of the world's most important political and diplomatic gatherings. You can learn more at g0media.com slash global stage. I'm Susan Glasser, and I want to thank all of our guests today and for all of you who are watching. See you again soon.